the question was that the Uh, we are Team Soul Rounded. We have Hui, Glendon, Bella, Nelson, Echo, and myself, Anjali, on the team. Our instructors are Heather and Mo. Our client, Rene, is a photographer, artist, a political activist, and a lecturer. She uses, she works, her works capture the identities and beauties that lie within her subjects. She uses both her nude and clothed body to celebrate black womanhood and deconstruct stereotypes in her work. Jessica Moss is an artist, an independent curator, and an art consultant. She runs her own art consultancy, curates exhibits and performances. The Mattress Factory is a contemporary arts museum in Pittsburgh. The Mattress Factory has pioneered the development of alternative art forms through site-specific installations, performances, and videos. And now I'll invite Bella to talk more about our project goals. Thanks, Anjali. <clears throat> so our client reached out to us because they want to make the art interactive. For our project goals, we want to integrate Renee's art style with modern interactive technology and use the space from Mattress Factory to create an immersive and inclusive space. So we will have two rooms from Mattress Factory where one room can be used for an interactive piece and the other one will be used for projection mapping. <clears throat> All of the resources coming from Renee, we have did several animation tests with different art pieces and body figures. And finally, we decided to use these two pieces to start building our prototype. So Renee has dedicated her career in deconstructing stereotypes and reconfiguring human body as using nude form as a subject. So for our experience, we want our guests to also use their body as part of the trigger for the interaction to start the animation where in our design, we used, we, uh, we will uh, let the artwork followed by the movement from the guests so that the emphasis of body will be <clears throat> focused both in Renee's artwork and also for the guests themselves. 
And this interaction method will expand the 2D form for Renee's art into a more spatial format. By interacting with this artwork, the guests are stepping into an immersive space, expanding their individual experience into the environment, observing other guests' interaction and poses. So the guest interaction and poses serves also as a part as the, in this art exhibition. They completed and augmented this artwork by recreating and regenerating the new art formats. For the interaction part, since Renee's artwork has mostly be single pieces for 2D artwork, after we developed the prototype for the interaction, we asked Renee to test this in the ETC, and it inspired her of combining these two interactions together, where the figures here as a Pac-Man and the tree man reminded her the history of lynching in black American history, where the tree here represents the tree of life and the Pac-Man is the outside attacker, eating off the victims from the tree and nutrient himself, where <clears throat> after eating a certain amount of victims, the tree the tree man will escape from the Pac-Man, starting a revolt and running into the next room. Next, I will pass it to Echo to talk more about our animation. Thank you, Bella. So we came up with the idea of detecting guest gestures by Kinect uh, to trigger the animation. As this image has a tree shape, we designed the animation of tree growing. So our interaction is basically when the guests pose like the man on the bottom, like this, the tree is going to grow into a complete one. So for, in terms of the guidance for guests, we plan to keep uh, Kinect skeleton as the guidance because we think when people stand in front of the Kinect skeleton, it's kind of natural for them to move their bodies to figure out what they can do. We also rigged all men on the tree to make sure that when guests continue to move their arms after the tree has been generated, all men on the tree can still move and react to the audience um, spontaneously. So they are going to act as if they struggle to escape from the tree. For the Pac-Man image, the inspiration is also obvious. So we use Kinect as well and make the, make the guests control the opening and closing of the Pac-Man. So we can see that we keep the Kinect skeleton here as the guidance for guests. So our two interactions will be controlled by two guests at the same time ideally, but we also made some designs in the physical space to make sure that either one guest or more than two guests can also have a good experience. We will explain that later. Now I'm going to show you guys a demo for the whole interaction part. So we can see that the tree is, sorry. So we can see that the tree is generated and the guest is going to control the Pac-Man to open and close to eat the man on the tree. So when half of them are eaten, the stage is going to change. We can see the Pac-Man is going to speed the man out and the men are going to escape. Yeah. So we were, when we went to Mattress Factory with Renee, we found that the physical space is actually two rooms connect together, which inspired us a lot. So we decided to put all interaction part in the first room, and uh, for the second room, we will, it will be a, ma a projection mapping room. So when the men on the tree escape, they're actually going to escape to the second room via the wall in the middle of the two rooms. So here in the projection mapping room, we are going to show a video created by Renee. Here is a short clip that can give a general idea about the video. Now I'm going to pass to Glendon to explain more about the physical space. Thank you, Echo, and thanks, Renee, even if she is not here. But thanks for the amazing artwork. And it is clear that our final deliverable will be a physical exhibition in the Matrix Factories Annex Gallery, and it's actually on the third floor. Here will be the kind of general floor plan of that space, and you can tell the first half will be the interactive piece, and the second will be the projection mapping room. And this is the journey map uh, within that space. People will follow one, two, three steps to enjoy the exhibition. And for the, pro for the interaction piece, we will put a semi-transparent film in the middle of the room, which will kind of, kind of divide the room into two different spaces. And with the film, 
we can tell our audience that how many people can be included in the interaction. Also, people can, because they can see from the both sides of the film, and we can somehow control the crowd within that space. This is a more detailed version of that. Uh, so after entering the room, people will see from the first spot, and after entering the second spot, they can see the uh, tree interaction. Considering if there is only one people entering the room, then he will be able to interact with the Pac-Man at the first. And second, after entering the second spot, he will notice the tree interaction and suddenly realize there will be some interconnection between the two different segments within that interaction. And if there will be more than two people entering that room, considering there are more people entering that room, and because uh, as Echo mentioned, we will keep the skeleton in the screen so that it can work as uh, indirect control to tell our audience how many people can be included in this kind of experience. This is a closer view from different perspective. And the second half of the interactive piece will be connected to the next room, the projection mapping one. As the demo shows, after the man running into the next room, it, will, it can work as a kind of connection and bridge to the next, our projection mapping room. And for the projection mapping room, we will put several benches in the middle of the room. They can help us to hide the projectors which projects on the ceiling. Also, the, the, all the benches are a place for our audience to sit down and appreciate Renee's work. Oh, hello, Renee are here. And because uh, they are sitting down on the bench, which can help us to prevent their shadow on the wall. And later I will pass to Hui to talk more about our technology. So thank you, Glendon. And for technology parts, we're gonna use projectors and keynet to achieve our goals. And projectors are for projection mapping parts and also to achieve the projecting the game image into the semi-transparent films. As Bella mentioned before, we want to like connect our Renex work, in, uh, uh, connect our body parts to Renex work. So we want to use, so one thing that comes to our mind is Kinex. Uh, Kinex can capture the video and game image and then using this kind of data to reveal a kind of skeleton here in Unity scene. And for that, we have two kinds of interactions. Uh, the first interaction is uh, when we have post have a certain pose, and animation will be triggered. And the second one is we can control the movement of the image, uh, uh, the movement of the arm in the image, and then we can uh, uh, as, uh, as guests uh, move their arms, they can change the arms in the image. Uh, here is our first interaction. We build kind of the algorithm according to the body points, and then we can trigger the animation only when we have a certain pose. Uh, the other in interaction we have, uh, we achieve this kind of effect by uh, rigging some IK points and skeleton in the 2D image. Actually, we are controlling the right points here in the right picture. Uh, we, by changing the position of the right, uh, right uh, red points, we can uh, control the pigment to open or close. Uh, we have some code to get the data from the hand points from the kinets. Uh, and then we can change the right point position according to uh, the position of your hand points. And we uh, encounter some technical difficulties during the whole project implementation. The first one is uh, with the Kinet 2. Uh, there are some detect error with the Kinet 2. Uh, like when we have multiple skeleton detect or uh, we cannot see parts of our body or we cannot or we are getting too close to the kinet the kinet cannot see us as you can see from the picture here the skeleton here is kind of messed out here um, we have uh, the second uh, te technical difficulty we have is the tracking performance problem there is less pr uh, ideal performance uh, tracking performance in a darker environment or we have a darker darker clothes or we have a darker skin. Also, uh, sometimes uh, the kinet will lose track of the shoulders or hips if we turn around our bodies. 
and also Kinet also have some problem uh, if uh, Unity doesn't support multiple Kinet two if we if we want to have two or three Kinet in one scene, and also we might to need to synchronize multiple Azure Kinet if we want to use two or three Azure Kinets. And for next, I will pass it to Nelson to tell us more about the Azure Kinet and Kinet two. Okay, thank you. So as Hui mentioned, we run into a lot of problems with Kinect 2. So that's where we're going to process our uh, future development into Azure Kinect. And the main feature of the Azure Kinect is that of a time of flight sensor, which does not rely on any visual image to like do the actual body tracking. So that's, uh, that's why it works much better in pitch black scenario and with what people wearing black clothing. And they also have a built-in Unity API that allows for more joint detection. So in that case, uh, it does a much better job at body tracking, even if you're partially blocked by some other stuff like object or other players. And you also have a built-in synchronization feature that we're going to use so it doesn't uh, trouble us when we connect two devices into one Unity project. Some other features include uh, inertial mesh unit, which help with the synchronization process and allow for more versatility. So this is how we're going to connect our connect together. So there will be one master connect, and we'll connect one or two other connect with, uh, via a 3.5 millimeter audio cable. And with it, the audio connect can synchronize and scan a whole point cloud data of the whole room, including all the players together. So this is our setup with two or three connects. As you can see, both setup in almost include the whole room. But with the three connect setup, Two of the connect is actually fitting the player directly, so that's a lot for, for a better body tracking performance. But with a triangular setup, like the picture shown in here, it's much difficult to do. So that's the end of our presentation, how we invite my teammates back. And uh, to summarize, we are team surrounded, and we're doing a immersive interactive exhibition for artist Rene Cox and curator Jessica Moss. And we're open for Q&A now. Thank you very much. somebody else experiencing it in progress, right? You did a good uh, explanation uh, of the sequence of your event. What happens if somebody walks in, or are you controlling how the maximum amount of people that can go into that room? Is this an observation thing too, or do I have to participate? Uh, I think it's for both sides. If there is only one people in that room, you can tell from the kind of, because we have the, this kind of semi-transparent film in the middle. If you can tell there is one person on the other side, if, even if you walk into that space, you can enter in, into this kind of interaction. Or if there are already two people playing with that, then it's also a good place for you to just observe and try to kind of see the funny interaction within that space. So are, are there plans to maybe take some of the interactive parts of the front part and use that to help with the immersive second room? Maybe changing the speed or the composition or something based on how people are interacting in the front? Or is the second part just immersive, no interactive? So, yeah, so, yeah thanks for, yeah, the, it, it's a good idea. And when we are talking uh, with Rene, Rene kind of depicted the second place as a utopia-like style. And our idea is more like have the running man escape to the next room and maybe the man will stay at some default place in that room. It can, it can show some of the continuity between this room. And we're like kind of still exploring more possibility with the kind of control and speed up maybe this kind of possibilities. Yeah, we'll definitely try to find out a way to build up the connection, yeah. You mentioned that when you got the prototypes up and running and tried them, it really affected the process. We got, it sparked ideas, it sparked you know, changes. I'm kind of curious, for your plan for installation, is the plan to install sooner and iterate, or what? What's your schedule and timeline for, for that part of the process? Uh, so we're going to start installing at the mattress factory by week 13 because that's when we get the space. Before that, our plan is to create a mock space at the ETC and do weekly testing and iterations. Yeah. Bob. Is there anything symbolic about the gesture? 
because that was triggering the animation. So I'm wondering why that metric. I don't know if you answered. All right, so the question is if uh, the hand gesture is symbolic to something, then I do um, So the hand gesture was originally coming from Renee's artwork, The Tree Man. So the body gesture kind of represents the tree uh, figure in the, this artwork, which also in our interaction, it also represents uh, the tree from the lynching history that the body gesture is mimicking the tree figure. Thank you. Time for one more. All right, congratulations. Thank you, Kazan Tang. And let's welcome Renee and Jessica for visiting ETC. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We are RVH, and welcome to our house presentation. So this is a team. Maria and I are the co-producers. Jimmy and Eric are our programmers, and Ivy is our um, 2D artist and UI designer. And our, our instructors are Scott and Ruth. So our project goal is to spark uh, children's interest in aviation as a career. And our client is the Museum Lab, the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. And they are hired by Hosanna House to do an exhibition about aviation. And for the recent two years, the exhibition is about the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, the location is uh, at the Hosanna House exhibition space. And the demographic is children from 9 to 11 years old, predominantly African American kids. And here are some related work we looked at before we started our design. So A Museum is a past ETC project that also uses AR and is also hired by the same client. So they use AR to um, interact with physical objects in space. And X-Plane is a um, flight simulator we looked at. They, uses a very, they use very realistic 
playing models. And we also looked at some other component-based games before we started our design. So here are some of our quarters idea. Uh, so at quarters, we thought that we can use airplane components to build an airplane. And we also thought about having students maneuver the airplane to learn about the physics of airplane. So some feedbacks we got is that it's a little overscoped to um, have all, both of these ideas be done within the semester, and also that our goals were too vague. So we listened to all of these feedback and adjust our design accordingly. And our experience goals include um, to spark kids' uh, interest in careers within aviation, to teach them about airplane components and how it makes the airplane fly, and to teach them the historic relevance of P-51 Mustang, which is the airplane used by the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, within this experience, we hope that they will communicate and collaborate together. And now I'll hand it to Ivy to talk about our experience overview. Okay, um, so we developed on our quarter ideas to the experience now. Uh, the experience will mainly take place during the visit. Uh, uh, it's mainly the students will form groups. Uh, they will read through the manuals and get their, get their roles. Um, they will go into the component hunt around the space. They will assemble the plane inside the app, and they will finally have an excitement moment after the assembly. While the experience mainly take part during the visit, we are also planning to uh, make some teacher preparations before the visit and prepare some souvenirs after the visit. Uh, so during the stage one, the teacher will give the student groups of three and each student will receive a distinct role of physicist, historian, or engineer. And they will each receive a physical manual according to their role. Uh, while, while we're mainly designing for a group of three, we recognize that this is not always the case. So uh, if there are groups of four, two students can share one single role of the engineer. And uh, the teacher will let them read through the manuals and get, uh, get the feeling of expert in that uh, position. Uh, after they read through the manuals, the teacher will hand out the shared stuff of uh, the iPad and the component inventory. So uh, for the manuals, we're designing them uh, so that the students can learn some of some basic knowledge about flying and aviation, but also uh, interesting and uh, easy to read. So we uh, increase the amount of images in the manuals and try to use less words. So um, for example, on the manuals of the physicist, we can see that it talks about basic forces and the relation between forces and speed and altitude. Uh, on the manuals of the historian, it talks about the development and characteristics of P-51 mass 10, and it also has a chart of Morse code, which they will use in the following stages. And for the engineer, uh, he or she gets to know, uh, here is the different types of wings, but we also have uh, other components. So uh, once they combine this uh, information and communicate with each other, they're going to uh, figure out which of the component is the right that they're going to hunt. And here's the component inventory, the public list they will receive after they read through the manuals. And after they read through the manuals, the teacher will hand out the iPad with the app where uh, a narrator will pop up and tell the background story of our uh, experience. So the narrator is a female African-American teenager and she's the great-granddaughter of the Tuskegee Airmen and she wishes to fly her inherited P-51 Mustang, but the plane is lacking some of the components, so she wishes the team to help her find the opponent components and assemble the plane. And uh, we're already interviewing with this actress and we'll use her image and voice as uh, in, in our future development. Uh, Jimmy will talk about the following stages. Hi, um, so on stage three, uh, the students will uh, go to do the component hunting game. And as we previously mentioned, uh, we will divide the class into a group of three and each of them will have a, a specific roles and a manual. 
and in the manual, there will be a lot of information about the uh, P351 and also some hints about how you find the correct one. So after the students uh, discuss with each other and identify the correct one, they will uh, use the, the most code table to decipher the most code and then use a tablet to like explore in the space and to scan the AR, code, AR markers to find the correct component. And these are some of the uh, 3D models we will use in the, in the game. And I'll show a little demo for the, for the game. So this is the most code table. And after the student deciphered it, they will use the iPad to uh, scan the AR markers and corresponding component will show up. And after the students collect uh, at least one component for each type, they can start the assembly game. So by doing the assembly, they will use the uh, drag and drop uh, uh, gesture to like, uh, dra drag the component from the inventory to the correct position onto the airplane. And if they uh, accidentally drag the wrong, uh, collect the wrong one, the narr narrator will pop up and tell them that you have to go back to the previous stage to correct the right, uh, the right one. And this is the airplane after the, the student uh, correctly assembled it. And this is the demo for the uh, assembly game. So uh, you can see that the player can uh, move around in a space and drag the component and to like attach the component into the right angles or right position onto the airplane. So uh, after the student uh, finished the assembly, uh, we, we will let them to like place the uh, AR airplane onto a space or on the ground. And then we, uh, we are planning to like the, uh, build some flying animations or take off uh, clips of the airplanes so they can play the videos and then take some photos with the AR planes. And they will uh, share these uh, exciting moments with their friends or through some social media. And next I will invite uh, Eric to talk about the AR technology we are going to use. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, to implement what Abby and Jimmy talked about, we evaluated different AR technologies, and, and here's the first technology we evaluated, which is called apps. It, it is a um, beacon system. Uh, essentially, the walking mechanism is quite similar to GPS, except that the satellites are replaced by beacons, which emit ultrasound signals. Actually, in this room, we have four beacons, two in the front and two um, in the back. And the beacon system um, can detect, accurately detect user's device uh, to a precision about 10 centimeters in comparison to meters by GPX. However, this technology does not match our design very well because what we need is the, the position of hidden objects, but th this, this technology tells us the position of user's device. So we moved on to evaluate another technology, AR markers. This is a pretty robust and mature technology and does not require any hardware like beacons. Um, the only problem with this technology is drifting issues. So if the, if the camera can see the markers, it knows where to place the augmented objects. If not, the camera has to rely on its sensors, on the sensors, to infer the position. Um, then the error will be accumulated if it's running for a long time. Fortunately, this is not a problem in our project because the markers will be only used in the uh, trail hunting stage, which won't last for too long. Another useful technology is plane mark anchors. Essentially, the system will scan uh, flat surfaces, such as floor or walls, and build AR experience on detected plane. Um, this is useful because when multiple teams are playing simultaneously in the room, we need to avoid the crowding effect. And with this uh, playing anchors, each team can, can uh, set up their own workspace 
anywhere in the room. So by using these technologies, we created a prototype and play test with two children. And I'll pass to Maria to talk about the play test. Thank you, Eric. Um, so as Eric mentioned, play testing is an important part of our project. Um, and thus far, we've carried out three rounds. The first two with ETC students here in the building, and the third one at Hosanna House with a group of four children within our target demographic. So the first two rounds, the purpose of them was to test the asymmetrical cooperation that we wanted to set up with the manuals. As Ivy explained previously, the manuals have different information and uh, the guests have to communicate what they see in each manual to identify the correct P51 components. Um, so that's what we did with the ATC students. And then once we had iterated those manuals, we went to the children and to set out the full prototype experience with them. So this is a look at those sessions. So with the ATC students, we iterated the manuals four times. We changed the roles. We changed the number of people in each team to find what made more sense. And we also adjusted the content of the manuals. Um, so we made sure that it was readable, uh, understandable, engaging. And we also, as you can see, iterated on the AR markers a bit. So we have different versions of them. And the purpose was to test the stage one of the project, so introduction to the experience, and stage three, which was component hunt. And once we had that, we went to uh, the children, and we did a full playthrough of the experience with paper, um, so we could get their feedback in regards to this. And then we introduced the tablets to show them what we have up to now, and to see them interact with the AR scanning and the other aspects that we've built. So from this, we realized that what's successful about the project is the introduction of technology. They were very excited about this. The idea of building through components and also the idea of deciphering a code um, to hunt for pieces. However, going to future developments, we are fully aware that we tested our manuals initially with adults. And so now we know what to modify for these children. So that is a big task for us. And um, adding to this, we still want to add more components to the experience. So right now we have engines and wings. We want to add five total, and we need to improve the app, integrate the parts that we have built at the final stage, and improve the UI and um, record and photograph our actress. And we also need to create the teacher guides that were previously mentioned. So in summary, our creation is a project that is directed towards kids ages 9 to 11. We want to spark their interest in aviation using augmented reality and after our play, our play testing, we realized that our main task is to balance educational content that is complex, but making it engaging and fun in a full experience in an aviation exhibit. Thank you, and we are now open for questions. Um, I think through the playtesting session, we realized that they, the kids are most excited about the technology. Uh, so at first, we gave them the paper prototypes, and then they thought it's like schoolwork. Um, but once they saw the AR and saw the um, components uh, in the space, they immediately say, oh, that's so cool. And um, so I think that's the thing that they are most excited about. Um. The use of Morse code, I'd like to ask a question about. Um, my father was a Morse code operator, so forgive me. <laughs> um, there was a physical component to the rhythm of tapping it out and hearing it, which the reading from the camera seems to skip over. Could you talk to me about your design choice in that area? Yes. Uh, so this is a, a concern that was brought up uh, before. By, by our instructors. And oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we initially used the NATO phonetic alphabet, which uses words like Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, um, to connect with the markers. But it's very easy, um, as we saw in play testing, to just say, Alpha starts with an A, I have to look for an A. You can bypass the, the deciphering. Um, then we move on to Morse code, because we thought it would 
add that level of complexity, but obviously there's the oral aspect to it. And then we consider uh, signal flags from uh, airplane. Yeah, I, I know what yes. Um, but so we play tested with the Morse code with the children, and they were quite excited about it. So we are still considering whether or not that introduction of the uh, of the sound is relevant to them. Um, it's something that we're still figuring out. Um, and to add to that, I think uh, we also consider because of the space of the exhibition is very small. Um, it's about the size of RPIS, I would say. And with all of the students in there talking and moving around, we thought that adding too much sound wouldn't be a good uh, choice to go. As an eight-year-old being taught Morse code by his father, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Your age range got younger, it seems, and the physics discussion seemed for an older crowd. Where is the physics work going to go for a 9 to 11-year-old? Yes, uh, so we actually, when we uh, narrowed down, narrowed down sorry, our target audience, we were thinking 12 to 14. And then we, our play testers were 9 to 11. And we realized that their enthusiasm is worth exploring at that age. Um, the manuals that we showed you were designed, again, after play testing with adults and thinking about 12 to 14 year olds. So we certainly must modify those for our new uh, target audience. Um, but we think that in terms of the physics, we can make it more about uh, direction of forces, movement, um, simplify it, but not necessarily lose it. Um, but again, I, I believe personally that we do require more play testing to determine exactly what works for them and what they can understand, but learn from as well. I don't know if that answers the question. And uh, one detail that was shown in playtesting is the kids were very excited to know that the engine goes right behind the propeller in P51. P uh, they mentioned that they would guess it would go in the back or um, not so close to where the pilot is. So I think information like this uh, also makes them interested in aviation. Exactly, yeah. All right, that's time. Sorry. <laughs> Good job, Thank you. Hello everyone, good morning. We are Intermatter and our team members are Jill, Zibo, Constanza, Lauren, and Ferris. And we have uh, Dave and Heather as our instructors. What we are pursuing is to enhance meditation by exploring the power of biofeedback in VR. So central to our project is the question of what barriers prevent people from meditating. Uh, we've assessed that some people have difficulty judging progress, um, telling, am I doing it right, am I improving? In addition to this, uh, some people might not have access to a real-life environment which is conducive to effective meditation and free of distractions. Finally, some people might struggle to sustain a continued interest in meditation. So through biofeedback, we hope to uh, provide an indicator of progress to our users in the form of their physiological responses. Uh, through virtual reality, we have the ability to cultivate an immersive meditative environment 
uh, with the added benefit of potentially drawing in new users through this uh, emerging new medium. Yeah, so there are a lot of VR meditation apps out there, and some of them do use biofeedback. However, most of them are focused on a guided breathing meditation, which is controlling the rate of your breath uh, at a certain pace. And for biofeedback, they'll have this visual indicator of your breath going in and out that helps you match up with the target pace. Uh, we're doing something a little different, focusing more on a general mindfulness meditation that isn't just directly controlling your breath. And that means we'll be exploring other forms of biofeedback that might be more indirect. So what we're doing is we're collaborating with Equa, with Equa Health, a mental health startup from CMU that uses evidence-based meditation guide, audio guided sessions to introduce meditation to new users through the course of a 14-day program. So their goal is to target, or what they've been currently doing is targeting adults in high stress living, in, living and working environments, but they'd like to shift towards younger demographics of 16 to 30 years old. So they're interested in VR because that is a chance to look at that demographic and interest them more. And they're also interested in biometrics because they can use biometrics to from their side to look at progress. So what we're doing is we're adapting their intro session, Tour of Your Senses, which is a 20 minute audio guided, not breath focused session, which allows our biofeedback to show an indirect representation of the depth that they are meditating at. Yeah, so the first step to transforming this mobile experience into VR would be creating a virtual environment for the meditator to sit in as they listen to the audio guide. So we have a demo of our current prototype that has just that. Example, you might choose to notice the waterfall, the flower, or a nearby tree. Or you could just keep renewing your focus on the tree every several seconds. Yeah, so that was from the C chapter of Equus Meditation, which is centered around the three senses, seeing, hearing, and feeling. And within each sense, uh, the general structure is that the audio guide will ask you to do something, such as focus on an object you choose for a couple seconds, and then it'll, ask, uh, it'll check in and ask you, how did that go? And you can indicate your answer like it went poorly or it went well. And based on your answer, the script will change a little bit to tell you you did a good job or to encourage you more. And so the next question is, how do we transform these mobile interactions into something that works for VR? So based on our focus and the Equus content, we set up three design criteria, which is intuitive, responsive, and contented. So Equus content is based on the sensations. It requires the experience to be intuitive and not intrusive at all, so uh, that meditators won't be brick from their meditation flow. And also, we want to use bowel feedback to keep the user keep continuously interested so that they won't um, they won't be losing their interest, and so we want the experience to be responsive. And also, we want to make the uh, meditators feel connected to the VR environment so that the VR is not only bring them a stable environment for meditation, but also give them a sense of belonging. So, we, uh, based on these three design criteria, we split Aqua's UX into three states. So first one is the default state where the user won't feel, uh, won't have any interaction with the system. They will just hear the audio guide and follow the instruction of the audio guide. Uh, and they also can see the process of their meditation during uh, the process uh, in, in the screen. And, and then we go to the menu state. Menu state is what will be brought up by swiping any direction in the screen. And in the Aquas interface, meditator can see the name and the length of this chapter, and how uh, so they will know what this, what step they are in in the meditation, and they can also go backward or uh, forward in this meditation process, and they can fall, pause and exit the experience. So we want to adapt it into VR using gesture or controller interaction, as you can see at the right side of this page, and. Then we go to the check-in state. Check-in state is what Aqua designed to make the meditators feel more connected and perceived by the audio guide. So as Lauren ex uh, introduced, uh, in, uh, in check-in state, uh, the meditators will be asked a binaural question about their condition during the meditation process. So we want to adapt it to VR so that we will use uh, same. 
so that we will use the same technique that we will use gesture or controller to control this interaction. So we want to test this interaction to be the foundation of the rest part of our VR experience so it will have a consistency. So we invited eight testers and ETC to participate in this test and we, uh, we asked them to put their headset on and read an eye-closed meditation chapter to them and ask them about uh, eight instructions, eight interactions afterward. And we, afterward, we ask them about their preference over these interactions and their preference over the control over gesture. So we found that five of eight testers prefer gesture over controller, and among the gesture interaction, they would prefer tapping, uh, tapping or interacting with virtual objects so they will feel more connected. And uh, for the controller interaction, they will prefer squeezing the controller because it's intuitive to them. So after our test uh, on the check in point, we still have a lot of questions yet to be answered. Uh, those questions are how can we make this interaction uh, intuitive and comfortable for the users uh, that they will feel continuously interested in this environment and how can we present biofeedback in the best way that they will also feel the responsive trait of this experience. And also we want to compare our VR meditation process with the mobile meditation process to see how users feel the difference. So those are the questions will be answered in the incoming tests. Since quarter, our project has changed a lot, especially on biometric side. We originally planned to use Apple Watch to get the real-time heart rate data. But after we built up the Apple Watch app, we found out that the real-time heartbeat data is locked behind the API wall. And we can only get a processed heart rate every five seconds, which is insufficient for HRV calculation. So we decided to change our sensors. As a result of changing sensors, we've been able to reevaluate our needs out of the physiological indicators in our project. So uh, ideally, we want to measure this abstract concept of relaxation. And we were originally doing that through heart rate variability. However, HRV's connection to relaxation is through its impact on breathing patterns. Um, and in this process, uh, and its impact on heart rate, there's a lot of noise and, uh, it, within the body which actually dilutes this information slightly. So we've determined that breathing is actually a more direct measurement of relaxation than HRV by definition as it serves as the intermediary. So ideally, uh, we would then tailor our project to breathing rate as uh, closeness to relaxation is our optimal like, metric of what we're trying to achieve. However, uh, there are issues with sensor invasiveness and uh, potential availability of these sensors. HRV is just easier to measure in general. So since multi-sensor systems are available to us in the current stage of our project, we're actually going to be measuring both breath rate and HRV and our meditation's impact on them, and then using that data to make an informed decision down the line as to uh, which metric best suits our needs. So based on those findings, we did a research on different sensors on market and finally choose Hexox skin as our next step because it not only has both HRV and respiration rate data, which is beneficial for our further analysis, and uh, also they had an open API, which means we can easily access those data. And here is our new system architecture where we replace Apple Watch with Hexoskin and use Bluetooth and then iOS companion app and the server to transfer the data to Quest 2. So while we've been sense, uh, solving the sensor problem, we've also been developing our prototype. And the approach here was more to build a strong base to rapidly iterate on the biofeedback once we actually get our hands on the sensor. So for the environment, there were two major goals. One is to solve that initial problem of having distractions in your environment. So by removing those visual distractions and creating a relaxing and immersive space to be in, we can help the meditator connect more to the meditation. Uh, the second is supporting that rapid iteration. We've chosen a variety of natural elements, laid out the scene in a particular way, and chosen to stylize everything so it's easy to add biofeedback in, an, uh, in different parts of the environment in between playtests in a way that doesn't break the general cohesion of the space. And as we've been developing and like casually testing amongst ourselves, we found that we need to find a good balance between responsiveness and uh, not being distracted when it comes to the biofeedback indicators. To use breathing as an example, if the pulsating color change on this flower is tied to your breathing, 
Obviously that would be very responsive, but it might also be distracting. You might want to look at the flower instead of listening to the audio guide. And we'd have the opposite uh, dynamic with the ambient movement of the water. Less distracting, but also uh, perhaps less responsive. Uh, we, so in the interest of uh, uh, allowing for flexibility and iteration into the future, um, we have implemented a number of systems which enable us to uh, iterate. Uh, for instance, we have a UI curvature asset which allows us to uh, really efficiently develop virtual reality UI assets um, as we continue to evolve. We have a centralized shader and theme management system which allows us to set wide scale color and theme values as we continue to experiment with which color contrasts work best for our app. And we have a flexible chapter system with a really nice GUI which allows us to tweak different parts of our meditation and reorder certain parameters and, and uh, take out and put in different sections, um, allowing us to continue to develop our meditation uh, with relative ease into the future. Um, in addition to this, we've uh, implemented a number of systems which, while not currently available in our app, allow us a lot of flexibility moving forward, such as a secondary time system, which can distort the passage of time according to some kind of rhythm, be that a uh, heart rate or breath. Um, and this can be applied uh, very easily on uh, wide scale values like particle systems, um, animations, physics event, allowing for a high degree of abstraction. We've simulated biofeedback events, which allows us to uh, test and iterate in the absence of sensors. And we have a current uh, server framework, which is connected to the Quest 2, um, which allows a lot of flexibility in choosing our sensors because it serves as a sort of adapter, um, which we can then connect to whichever future sensors suit our needs. So in summary, some potential limitations that we might have is we could have sensor failure in connectivity or sensitivity. And then we could also have the biofeedback be less in impactful than anticipated. In both of these cases, we would shift more towards focusing on Equo's wants for a robust and polished product. And then for our next steps, we want to continue to build out, build out Equo's content in VR, investigate physiological indicators and responses to Equo's content, integrate biofeedback into, into the visualizations of our environment, continue to play test and iterate, and continue our user journey blueprint. So in summary, we are making a product using a Quest smartphone and Hexo skin. This product is a 20 minute uh, meditation session of Equa's tour of your senses with biofeedback virtually in implemented into the environment. And we are creating a proof of concept where we will leave behind documentation and the session so that Equa can use it to either further develop or test themselves. Thank you, we're now open to questions. Yeah, I think uh, we were kind of looking at how to do something slightly different than existing meditation uh, apps. A lot of them will use natural environments, so that we kept obviously, but a lot of them are like dark environments. The idea is that uh, it's less strain on your eyes. But because our like meditation is short, we can like have a bright environment. And uh, a lot of them have like these glowing mystical elements, and we kind of wanted to go towards a more like grounded painterly style. Um, just to like, I don't know, it's a space that hasn't been explored, so uh, we wanted to try that. There's also the fact that Equa's content has a um, process called noting and renoting, where people who are meditating look at different parts of the environment and focus on different focal points and like tell themselves what it is. So we want to have a wide variety of things that the meditator can choose to focus on so they can engage in the noting and renoting. Um, so, for example, in this room, I could notice the projector and tell myself that I am seeing and noticing the, pro the projector, and that would be a brief moment of noting, and then I would follow that with maybe three to five seconds of staring at the projector and considering its existence. Well, there are certain gestures uh, that seem to work better than others. Uh, things that people want to do with their hands uh, that foster more meditative engagement. So now we only tested uh, the gestures on the check-in point, which uh, where the user will be asked to ask a binary question, so they will only choose two gestures. And we tried like raise your left or right hand, like raise your hand in numbers, 
or uh, like tapping flowers or swiping, and uh, all those. We might not cover all of those gestures, but uh, obviously tapping it's less intuitive. Uh, it's less intrusive and more intuitive for the user to feel more engaged. So they won't, won't be have more mental occupation. So hopefully, as a student of this project, you came into the semester understanding what you're trying to accomplish. Other than the Apple glitch, what is your biggest surprise for our comment? I think we came in learning a lot more about, or like, without knowing as much about HRV. So our biggest surprise was looking at how, how tight the respiration rate is connected to HRV, regardless of the Apple Watch. Yes. So you guys ditched the Apple Watch because it was giving a reading every five seconds. I was wondering why it wasn't a fast enough for good enough. So the way that HRV works, you measure it based on different time intervals. Um, and because it's a, it's essentially like a, you take a standard deviation of the added time intervals and heart rate speeds up, speeds up when you breathe in and when you breathe out. So you need really minute intervals to get that calculation. And you can get something close to it if you have a 20 second breath where you take 10 seconds to breathe in and 10 seconds to breathe out. But that's not doable for just like a new meditator. Time for one more. I have one. So I'm going to follow up with Mo's question on the art. Um, so what I see here, uh, is this going to be the direction you're going, or is this going to change? Uh, yeah. So we uh, the question was, um, is this the direction that we're going uh, with regards to our art assets? And uh, actually, in our uh, prototyping phase, we tested nine different white box environments, and we determined the jungle one to be the um, most sort of meditative by means of voting. So we pretty much settled on this style of environment. Um, we compared it to like a canyon environment, a cave environment. Um, we also played around with different uh, like uh, lighting qualities and whatnot. And color palettes, yeah. And color palettes. Um, and so uh, while we are more or less set on this specific environment, we will continue to iterate the actual uh, color properties of the environment and the objects which are within it. Um, do you have any of that art we could see at some point? Not now, but at some point. Uh, yeah, we, we, have, we absolutely have screenshots of all of those. Um. All right, thanks, team. All right. Hello, everybody. We are Team Colorize. Welcome to Colorize's HABS presentation. Um, this is the team. Um, our faculty advisor is Ricardo Washington. Um, our client is Luke Harris, the director for the Center of the Arts and Education at West Liberty University. We've, we've also been working with two of her graduate assistants, Catherine Nelson and Lisa McGee, on the project. So Colorize's goal is to create hardware prototypes and documentation for, for activities that will, engage, that will engage kids in colored light and light color mixing in elementary school students K through second grade. So here's our metrics matrix. At the top we have gameplay and interactivity. Next we have play testing. Then we have prototyping. And after quarters we decided to bump up documentation. So why focus on light? Well, it's less commonly taught in schools. There's potential to be more innovative with the hardware and we get to focus on additive color mixing to avoid confusion with the kids. Going into this project, we had a few design requirements. One was to allow the teachers to supervise and guide. We want a short 15 minutes experience. 
We want to be able to reset easily. We want hands-on interaction with the kids. We want to reinforce color mixing. And we want to foster collaboration and communication between the kids. Now, early on, we had a few different types of brainstorms. One had no tech at all. Some included more com complex concepts about light. And another had a complete form factor attached to it. But we found faults in these ideas. One had not enough tech. Light frequency is too complex of an idea for our age group. And the form factor is less important than the activities themselves. So we got a few questions at quarters. How are you going to make this a robust piece of hardware? Well, we decided with the client on hardware prototypes and hardware documentation rather than building one finished durable product. Why well, settle on the cube form factor so we, early? We dropped the form factor and we started thinking of activities primarily. And will there be confusion between additive and subtractive light mixing? We focus on additive only using physical lights. And that's what brings us to our four prototypes that we tested with the kids. One is a color puzzle, one is the LED light strip activity, color whiteboard, and shadow puppets. We've play tested so far at two sites, once at West Liberty University with 20 kids K through eighth grade, and once at Marion Elementary with five kids in second grade. And after our play test, we came away with a few key pillars of our project. We want autonomous free play with room for guidance with the kids. We want easy setup for the teacher, and we want to get kids excited about the activity. And here's our target audience and play testers, as drawn by our artist, Chin. I'll now pass it on to Caitlin to talk about our first activity. Thanks, Max. So our first activity was actually the color puzzle, which is actually two different uh, software prototypes. We have this, whoop, sorry. We have this first one over here, which is the slider mixing experiment. Uh, where students would slide the two colors together to see how they'd mix in the center. The other one is a color mixing puzzle where students would choose the two colors that would mix to get the color below it. We chose to do this in software as a prototype for, uh, testing, the, um, for testing the quickly and testing the concepts. So we tested this at Marion <laughs> Elementary and West Liberty and we saw that there were, um, there were different outcomes to it. First, we noticed that there was a lot of guidance and direction needed. We did notice that like normal kids would like sounds and flashy stuff like a normal kid would. So that's something that we look forward to adding in. But um, we also noticed that they went through and used both apps intermixed, intermixed and uh, they would switch between the two to check their answers. So one thing that we noticed that was surprising was that they actually really liked the challenge. They liked the puzzles, they liked the, uh, the difficult puzzles. We gave them two different types of it and they chose the harder version over the easier version. We also noticed that it was surprising that they actually went between the two applications much, e much uh, quite often, which is something that we weren't actually expecting because those were supposed to be two different activities entirely. Um, however, we did notice that there were several challenges that we came across. One was that they kept uh, mixing up pigment mixing with additive mixing. We think this was an issue with it being on software instead of in hardware. Another thing was there was too much direction needed and the puzzle itself wasn't actually explorative enough to not need this direction. We also noticed that there was a high learning curve to the software that we were presenting to them. So plans for the future is that we're going to um, fabricate into hardware with the LED slider, which was our previous intention to begin with. However, the color puzzle itself is actually getting switched out for a different activity called a make a rainbow activity that we can discuss more during questions if anybody wants to know more about it. Now I'll pass off to Wizard for the next prototype. Thank you, Kevin. So the next activity is the light strip. How we design this activity, we provide the three bottoms, red, green, and blue, three primary tactile bottoms to let them can press one button and light up one LED along the light strip. And when you press in two buttons at the same time, you will create the secondary colors. And when you press the three buttons at the same time, you will light up the white light. And when you light all the LEDs along the light strip, it will play the ending light show and reset the light strip. 
So what we decided is, is that we think button pressing is a, a hands-on direction for kids, and also now all the LEDs along the light strip is a clean target for the kids. We expect by combining the RGB to create colors again and again, they can get into the color mixing. And while we're play testing, first we provide a third, first guidance is try to press the button to light up the strip. And then they will begin pressing single button and then now all the LEDs. And they were surprised by the ending light show. And in the second round, we provide a second guidance. How about you press two buttons at the same time? And this time, they were surprised that they can create more colors. And then we we'll began trying different combination to create more colors. And the playtesting of this activity is beyond our expectation. First, they could operate to take turns to press the button to create to love all the LEDs along the light strip. Or like, they communicate to create secondary colors as much as possible and compare it with primary colors. Or it just only add red and green light. And when we asked him why, he said, oh, I would like to create a Christmas light strip. Or they challenge themselves to uh, create a rainbow sequence. So what surprised us is that kids were satisfied with button pressing and enjoy creating secondary colors and watching the ending light show. And they were willing to again again and engage in this experience. Also, they, play, they will play with their own rules, like rainbow challenges, and also uh, design their, their patterns to express their emotion and creativity, like Christmas live strip. And after playtesting, when we ask them something like, how did you create a yellow light? They say, oh, I played a red and green at the same time. So that means they really get something about the light color mixing in this experience. And some of them even tell the new guests how to play it and how to create specific secondary colors. But the challenge we saw now is that the resistance of these buttons is high for some kids. Also, they need the guidance for pressing the multiple buttons to create more colors. Even we didn't tell them, they would never try that. Even they get the color mixing concept from the other activities. Also, for some kids, they need more motivation. About three kids only play two rounds, one for primary colors and one for secondary colors, and then just stop. So the plans for the future for this activity is that we want to improve the presentation of this activity. Let me add a theme or audio to encourage them to press multiple buttons or play it with more rounds. Also, we would like to improve the user interface, make it sturdy and easier to use. Now, I'll pass to Bob to talk about the whiteboard color. Thanks, Wizard. So, so the next activity we had was a colored whiteboard, which allows the kids to basically have a drawing and see how it's affected under different light combinations. So we have a drawing here, and we switch between red, red, light, and green. And when we tested it with kids, they were kind of respectful, and they were kind of using the entire space that they had, but they were also respectful of where they would draw. We gave them markers, and they only drew where they were supposed to draw. And then they really liked showing it for between different combinations. But what they really liked it doing was to do rapid, rapid movements between them, like really switching between that red and green and blue and try to see their own animations come to life in a way with that light. And when we tested with West Liberty University, there were some sixth and eighth graders, and they were really interested in getting into the picky nicky of the things of like, why does this work here? Why does it not work here? Why is it showing us? Why don't we see it right now? So again, to reiterate what really surprised us, what they really enjoy drawing, and they really want to see the effect on the different lights. They really want to switch rapidly between these different light combinations and see how those different light combinations affect the light. And they only drew on the dedicated space. Because of that, there was also challenges. So we had some hardware issues with the way that they were rapidly switching with things. The position of the light was not always optimal. It wasn't in like the best tops, uh, top approach. And because they were drawing, they would instinctively lean on the cardboard. And that gives us plans for the future. And those are like finding the right hardware, make sure it really goes with the way they want to play, give them more room to draw, and basically just build it for the natural drawing posture. And with that, I'm going to give it a chance to talk about shadow puppets.
Thank you, Bob. And I'm going to talk our next activity, which is Shadow Puppy. So this activity, we're going to use in red, green, and blue lights to and Shadow Puppets to enable the kids to learn and play through the projection on a white screen. And it also enables them to uh, learn about the uh, RGB color mixing theory we want to teach them. So through our play testing, the kids had a very engaging experience by role playing with the shadow puppets and uh, also by the uh, colorful shadows uh, they created by themselves. So we're going to create an immersive and also intuitive learning experience by having the kids to play with the shadows and also <coughs> to uh, explore the uh, RGB color mixing theory behind and how it different with the traditional pigment color mixing. And what we saw from the activity is that first, this activity is very easy to set up. And second, the, both the younger kids and the older kids love this activity because like the younger kids would love to do the role playing with puppets and they would like to see the colors they created by themselves. But the old kids will like uh, will be more curious and will like to explore how the colors are formed and what's the theory behind this activity. And the last is that our clients like this activity and would love to see the potential we could provide in our future development. So our future plans for this activity is we're going to deliver the clients a equipment list and also initial equipments. And we're going to also to offer some uh, different thing, color puppies to help the kids to qu quick start with this creative activity. So this is for the shadow puppy part, and I'm going to hand it to Xiao to talk about the conclusion part. Thank you, Chin. Now I'm going to talk about our takeaways and our plan for the future. For our takeaways, we found that our activities work the best in an open environment that fosters free play. We also found that physical lights convey the idea of mixing color of light better than screen or software. We found that LED strip activities have a lot of potential for engagement, and we're going to try to incorporate them more in other activities. We observed that kids really like the physical tactile buttons. Uh, they're very fun to play with. Last but, but not least, kids will naturally collaborate with each other using their own rules. Now, what are, what are our goals for the semester? For the whiteboard and LED activities, we're going to make the hardware prototypes either, of, either made of wood or cardboard. For the shadow puppet activities, we're going to provide an equipment list, uh, some initial equipment, and some sample shadow puppets. For all the activities, we're going to provide uh, the documentation that includes our design, how to set up, and how to replicate in case any teacher want to use them in the classroom. This is our timeline. For the second half of the semester, we'll be focusing on fabricating the activities, reiterate on them, and on week 14, we're planning on delivering the product to our client. Now, we want to thank everybody who helped us to set up the playtest, and we want to thank the faculty and staff at ETC who guided us along the way. This is our presentation. Thank you for listening. Now we're open for questions. Yes, Dave. I'm kind of curious, so you have the digital prototype. Are there next steps for that one? Is that being turned into something physical or what? Yes, it will be turned into physical prototypes. Yeah. So, uh, there's, so there's two software ones that you saw. You saw the sliding one and you saw the puzzle one. Uh, we saw that the puzzle one needed a lot of direction, which is not what we really want with the kids to see because we, we kind of understood from our client that the kids learn more when they're having fun and they set their own task and have a room to explore. So we're, we're going more for the switching one, and the other one that you saw with the color puzzle is being replaced with a rainbow activity. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that. Um, one of your challenges slides, you talked about, um, particularly with the puzzle, 
that the kids didn't know what to do at first. They weren't quite sure. Yeah. And you change it to the rainbow. But you didn't explain why that makes it easier for kids to get into it and do it you know, without, having, without any sort of facilitation. Yes, so the Make a Rainbow activity is something that's a lot more um, freeform. It has a lot more uh, choices that you can go through. Uh, it's essentially like clicking a bunch of different buttons and then creating rainbow and seeing how these colors mix together to uh, make the colors up at the top. Um, we have a small demo of it. But uh, essentially, it's a way to have a puzzle-like theme make a rainbow, but they don't exactly have to have as much direction. It's much more intuitive with just you know three buttons they could randomly click and then see what happens, and they go, oh, this is what happens. And so they get to explore more than with the puzzle one, which they were looking at and going, OK, this is a lot of negative feedback. What am I doing wrong? So documentation is one of your goals. Do you have plans on testing your documentation with teachers? That's a, that's a good question. I think um, we, once we have um, our activities more settled down and fabricated, and once we uh, get into more play tests, we'll try to get a document, like a draft of it, um, done as soon as possible and uh, Send, we have two graduate assistants and Lou who can uh, look at the, the uh, documentation for us. She, I, I'm sorry, I have another question. The puppet, the puppet show, the puppet activity seems to me, for, it seems to be one of your best. Okay. And the reason being that it's interactive and there's a story. You can create narrative with that. You know, hang a narrative around that. And to me, that seems you could scaffold that in a number of different ways, as opposed to, you know, just, I don't know, I don't know what you're going to plan on taking it further, but that's something, that's rich material, it's yeah. rich, rich, rich material to deal with. Yeah, and our, our clients saw the potential in that, too, about different activities like creating your own shadow puppets, you know, having students, you know, do things before they go into it, covering different lights, seeing how they react, you know. Story. Yeah, yeah, and and kids were creating their own stories pretty pretty naturally, and I think the idea is that we we give them the nice equipment list. We we do the research to find lights that will work well in the classroom that are easy to set up. We give them some initial shadow puppets, and then they can build lesson plans around the uh, the tech that we've provided for them. Back for one more. Yeah. Um, it was fascinating to me. In old theatrical lighting designers, that the additive mixing with real lights turned out to be um, a thing that succeeded for you. That's fascinating to me. Um, I'm not sure with the way the shadows are cast, how are you communicating the effect of the additive color mixing so, in that scenario? Your videos were great. I just didn't see how the concepts were connected. Yeah, uh, great question. So in part of our equipment list, we're going to send them a power strip that can basically turn off and on those RGB lights. So then they can basically add them up as they see. So basically they can start with a red light, and then they would see a right frame, and they would see a black shadow. And then they can build up by turning on the green, and then they will see the mixes of those shadows. So basically it's a build up with the RGB LEDs fixtures. Thank you for that question. No, thank you. I, that wasn't clear. Sorry. No, don't worry about it. No. All right. Good job.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the HAPS presentation for Project Team ECHO. Our faculty instructors for this project are Brenda and Dave, and our client is the organization Games for Change. So what is our project? Games for Change has tasked us with delivering a full transformational game experience that will be showcased in the Games for Change Festival in mid-July. Along with this final deliverable, the client had a list of goals that they'd like us to achieve for this project. So the first was to create a project that is rooted in the topic of environmentalism. We aim to empower our guests to action as opposed to making them feel powerless and hopeless because sometimes with environmentalism that can be an issue. And lastly, we want to foster a sense of community between the guests who are going to experience this. So based on our client goals, we were able to establish the three most important parts of our metrics matrix. The first being playtesting so that we can actually see if the transformations we want to achieve are achievable. The second is transformational content accuracy so that we can ensure that the knowledge we give our guests is both informative and accurate. And innovation and research, which ensures we are able to narrow down our topic as environmentalism can be quite broad and not scopable in one semester. So with the client's goals and the metrics matrix, we were able to decide that our topic is eco-friendly fashion and sustainability. So we have a few reasons for deciding on this topic. One of them is because it is very relatable. Everyone in this room, it is something like, that you deal with every day in your life, so it can touch a lot of different people. The second is that fashion industry is the second largest polluter in the world behind the oil industry, so it definitely has a pretty big impact on the environment. And lastly, this topic allows us to explore both individual change and communal change. So now that we picked a topic, we needed to figure out how we were going to get from there to a full deliverable experience that will happen in July. So from there, we were able to develop a few strategies to approach our topic. So the strategies that we came up with for, again, creating a Games for Change, we're focusing on our transformational framework as well as pro paper prototyping. With the transformational framework, our goal is to really understand where our audience is right now in the moment, where we are trying to get them, the goal of our overall um, prototype, as well as what changes, what activities we need them to undergo in order to reach that transformation. It's not just a lesson where we are looking to teach them something, they just take in the information, we're actually looking for them to make a transformation in their lives. And so with that, we use paper prototyping and prototyping in general as a way to iterate on that. We don't want it to be something that is very static, something that is going to be the same no matter who's experiencing it. We want it to be um, interactive, something that each individual feels is relevant to their own lives. So when we've come up with those strategies, we want to also come up with a high level purpose for what we're trying to do. And again, specifically for fashion, we want to create more eco-friendly shoppers. That is something that's a lot more relatable than something that's high fashion, something that wouldn't be individual to each person, but just saying the options that you can get access to, you can be a little bit more eco-friendly. With that, the high level purpose can be a little bit more inspirational than practical at times, so that's not where we're going to leave it. We do want to take that into next steps. So we need to look at how do we actually achieve this transformation? How do we go from where people are currently into eco-friendly shoppers? And we do that by first needing to address the barriers. So if it was really easy, if they were just going to be able to be eco-friendly shoppers, you know, they, they just would be. It would be that simple, but there are things standing in their way. Specifically with fashion, with shopping and the clothes that you wear, a lot of things that we've noticed are comfortability, are price, are going to be the appearance. And we are not looking to eliminate those barriers. Realistically, those are going to stay as barriers for some people. It's not going to be something we can say, hey, just wear different clothes. That's not going to work for people. But what we are targeting are understanding the items, the terms, the facts, so that you are more empowered about the options you have available to you. It isn't just, hey, I have these barriers, I have no choices in what I'm doing. It's, no, there's more out there than you might think, and we can help you understand what you do actually have the power to do. And then navigating information. A lot of companies are not making it easy for you to go out and find the information that you want, because their goal is to make money, it is not to help you as a consumer. And so we want to be able to empower the individuals to say, no, you don't have to just listen to what this company says, you can actually move past that. So with those barriers, we've been able to establish some transformational goals. And these transformational goals, again, are to know what skills you actually have access to, what skills you can build up and practice and gain to 
understand those eco-friendly options, as well as being able to understand eco-friendly materials, something that people don't necessarily already have experience with, something that they may be able to learn relatively easily, but it's something that they haven't considered previously. And along with that, understanding brands, understanding their practices and how potentially they aren't just trying to tell you the truth, they're trying to just you know, sell things to you. So, how do we know if we've achieved these goals? So that's, again, where we'll go back to prototyping, where we'll be able to actually iterate and check how do people respond to you know, knowing their barriers, how do they respond to this change, and how do we know that they've transformed? Okay, our first pr prototype is about sorting the different types of stores into eco-friendly and non-eco-friendly categories. And our goal is to observe the changes of their behaviors and thoughts after at the end of the playtest. And here is our playtest play pro process. First, we invite our guests to go through a, a shopping website like Forever 21 and ask them about their impression of this brand. They could say anything they want. And then our playtest began with a guidebook. There are different types of materials in this guidebook. And the guidebook shows the, how eco-friendly these materials are by three aspects. One is water consumption, the other is uh, energy consu consumption, and the third is recycled rate. And then we jump into two levels. The first level is like a tutorial we ask them to sort two types of stores into eco-friendly and non-eco-friendly categories. And the second level is we ask them to sort four types of stores into three categories, eco-friendly, non-eco-friendly, and both have pros and cons. And after the play test, we ask them to go through the same website again and to see their changes. Uh, we concluded that we have three changes that observed from our play testers. One is they can learn about materials knowledge after playtest. And second is they know what information in this shopping website is eco-friendly and what is not. And the third one is they can check the material labels in the shopping website. And let's go to the next uh, prototype. So for our second prototype, it was mostly focused around those barriers, again, that I had mentioned earlier. We wanted the play testers, as well as the people developing this project, to understand better about the barriers for different people. So we'd start with a relatively simplistic activity about picking out and building an outfit. And from there, we were able to give scores to these outfits, something that wouldn't necessarily be available to you if you were going to shop on a website, but something that, with a little bit of experience, with a little bit of domain knowledge, participants would be able to do on their own. And so for this example, for this shirt, we called out specifically that this shirt is claiming to be sustainable, that it's using a word that makes it seem eco-friendly, but then with a little bit more information, with it being pointed out, it's claiming something that it's just not backing up at all. And by giving participants this knowledge that the words presented might be a little bit more face level than they actually are if you dig a little bit deeper, we hope to inoculate them against misinformation in the future. So now, we went from picking our topic to paper prototypes. We still need to figure out how we get a final durable experience from here. So one of the things we did was to research some potential tech solutions to our durables. Looking back to our goals, our tech preparation should fulfill those requirements. We want to make, create a game that makes a change. We want to foster a sense of community between the guests. We won't allow everyone to participate easily. So our final decision on our platform choice will be Unity WebGL Build plus Air Console. We chose that because of two reasons. Uh, first, it is, uh, we can make a multiplayer experience uh, in an accessible way. Second, uh, it can, uh, Air Console allowed us to be uh, to play, uh, play both, both in person and uh, online. And next, we're going to talk about what the conference experience will look like. We're aiming for around 40 people to play at the place. We divided the attendees into five people group for them to have better bonding with each other and make it flexible for the uncertain amount of people. And in these conference scenarios, we will try to divide the experience into several rounds for them to have different kinds of transformation during the process, and at the end, they can share all their thoughts about the game. 
The game for the platform we pick, it will be five people use five mobiles with air console and one uh, computer. The game will include different kinds of government knowledge and have to make several decision making along the process. So we will give them a simple goal as like making a white t-shirt for the new upcoming seasons. So use the uh, categories we made from our first prototype. We try to divide them and let them be in charge of different kinds of garment production. For instance, materials, manufacturing, and how they branding and describe the certain product and how they decide which part they should do f f from a limit budget or resource. And we will then decide which company name they should have and assign another group as their competitive cooperation to strengthen the gameplay experience. From our first prototype, we understand that we give them the experience of learning different brands from multiple aspects, kind of strengthen the awareness of their behavior when they're doing shopping in the future. And after they investigate all their competitors, they will try to build their information page for their product. Again, each, if each person will be in, in charge of different parts of the page, and they will decide it together about what the overall page should look like. And after they creating this prototype, we will try to give them different kinds of incidents for them to rethink and question if this, there's any better solution for this product, taking like introducing new material as an, experience, as an example. The material lead will need to talk to financial lead and the design director about if this is doable. And these decisions will have the effect at the final result of the gameplay from the uh, carbon emission perspective and pollution perspective. At the end of the game, we will let them manufacturing the product. We'll try to visualize the factory and the surrounding environment based on the decision they make. For instance, how the manufacturing process um, contributed to different kinds of car uh, environmental changes and how the carbon footprint looked like during the whole process and how the consumers think about the product. And next, we're going to talk about how we to fulfill this game concept we currently have. Yeah, so from the, uh, the prototype visualization, we're going to be talking about our next steps until our deliverable experience. Here's our production timeline. Um, we're at halves right now. After six weeks, we'll be soft. Two weeks later, that will be finals. But our ultimate destination for our playable experience will be the Games for Change Festival happening from July 12th to 15th in New York City. Moving forward, the artists and the programmers will work together to refine our visual wireframes into a more polished iteration based on the feedback that we'll get from our presentation as well as the feedback that we'll get from more playtesting. The UX designers and the co-producer will reach out to more SMEs in order to discuss our topic more in depth in order to transition uh, into a digital product as efficiently as we can. In summary, um, Team Echo will deliver a transformational game about eco-friendly shopping experience that will be showcased in the Games for Change Festival in July. Um, our topic is rooted in environmentalism, which empowers guests to make a change through fostering a sense of community between the guests. And right now, we would like to uh, take our time to thank all of our playtesters and the faculty who are part of our project. And now we'll open up for any questions. Thank you. So what, the, the clothes or the, are you using name brands or are you making up names for the brands? We would ideally, or right now we're planning to use made up names because we don't want to like directly link with certain, but we're using actual brands as like the blueprint for like what information we're giving, but we're not going to say like this is H&M or this is this brand. We're going to, especially for the one prototype we did, we used different names, but we based it off of information from actual brands. Yeah, so going off of that, a lot of the actual verbiage, a lot of the wording was taken directly off of those brand sites and just the brand names would be changed because we know that when we would introduce something like this, if we use real brands that already exist, people are going to go in with bias and we're not looking to target that bias necessarily. We're looking to try to get past without any pre-existing notion of, hey, this brand is good or bad. What are you able to tell about the brand just by your knowledge? Am I 
second part is I'm not quite sure about the community aspect. You're saying you create communities. And I'm not quite sure. So we that is something we're still exploring, but we were sort of looking at, especially with fashion, there's an idea that through individual change there could be more of a community change where if enough individuals sort of change their habits, it could impact a more, uh, it could have more of a communal impact, especially on like corporations in terms of buying habits. Like if enough change occurs, like sometimes that's how things are sort of tracked. So that's kind of how we've been looking at it, but we also are still exploring how we can make it more communal as well. So I, I apologize if I missed this, and I know we're living in a COVID kind of world of safety and things like that. Uh, and we've done about five or six previous projects share anything you learned from those previous projects that is helping you move forward in the design of the loop? So it's been, we've definitely looked at past projects and it has been a little tricky because um, we are looking at a festival that is both in person and online. So obviously before this, there's not one that does both. There's only ever been just online or just in person. So we've kind of been looking at how different teams handled both of those experiences to sort of craft how we could approach something that is both. Um, yeah. A lot of experiences going on now like this as well. Mm -hmm. okay. yes. So adding on to that, is there going to be like an hour when this is supposed to be played? And how long is the experience? Yes, currently uh, we it will be in a set room for a set amount of time in person, um, online, I believe it also would be for a set amount of time, but I would need to confirm with our client. Uh, currently, we don't have a time for how long this will take right now, but we are still, as we play test, that's something we're still figuring out. There you go. This is an hour talk. One more question. So, mm -hmm. so this is for both online people and people present? Yes, because the conference will be split into two in-person days and two online days currently. Can I have one more? Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Street Lives House Presentations. I am Hagen. This is Ray, Cleo, Robin, Peter, and Tianga. Our instructors are Ruth Comley and Tom Corbett, as well as our clients are uh, Jessica Hodgins, who is a professor at the Robotics Institute at, at CNU's main campus, as well as James Dusing, who is a professor of art and animation at the College of Fine Arts. So what is Snobog? Snobog is a a window into a virtual neighborhood where you can bump into these unique characters that inhabit that space. This is a mobile AR app uh, that allows you to view these skits that these characters take place in. The current scenes that these, that these characters have, there's five scenes for each of the characters set combinations. So our client gave us gave this project and they also give us, give us a range of options for us to choose on. And so we'll be expanding the Snapbox app and we'll be focusing on these three points. The UI UX designers will be focusing on designing an intu a intuitive guide for the users as well as updating the current user interface. The programmers will try to improve the performance of the app and the artists will try to create a character customization option for the users. So a client wants this to keep an, an immersive theater experience rather than making it a game and that 
that gave us some constraints. So first of all, when we're designing UI, we don't want the UI to be intrusive. We want it to be as invisible as possible during the experience. Also, we don't want the character design to be cliche that reminds people of other things they have seen before. And um, finally, the client wants this project to pass through the semester. So when we hand it back to them, we want to make it maintainable and extendable. Um, we did a little related work research. So there was this animateering, a previous ETC project brought us by Brenna during the quarters. Um, they were using character mix and match for the puppeteering. And what we're doing is a little similar, but we'll be using animation retargeting to create more complex animation for our characters. And that will serve our storyline. Um, also, there are a lot of AR games got brought up during the quarters too, like Pokemon Go. So Pokemon Go was using GPS information to force players to go somewhere and find things. But our concept is a little different. Um, we will not be using GPS, and the, the players were just bump into the characters. Um, also, the AR was only a supplement of gameplay in Pokemon Go. Like, the players can turn it, turn it off when they want. But AR is essential for our project. So when the, uh, it, it is the window to the virtual world. And when we're, de when we're designing, we will try to not make our Snapbug app um, so game as the Pokemon Go. And then <clears throat> we are going to talk about the updates for the user interface. So we first start with analyzing our target audience. And we want to focus from young teenagers to senior citizens. And we try to accomplish the goal of creating an entertaining and colorful world with fantastic storyline. And also with simple and easy to use interface for senior citizens. So here is our the original version of the Snowbot. You can see it only has a uh, testing UI interface, which is very simple. And this is our UI design evolution from the beginning to now. And we have totally seven different wireframes and prototype for play testing. And then in the beginning, we want to add some extra function to improve the playability for the experience, which are gallery and history. So after talking with our client, they feel like the actual functions are not the priority things to do. And they hope us the app can have an invisible UI without any text. And the user can customize their own character before the experience. So here is our current user journey map. User open the app customize their own character, and find and scan the trigger items on the street, and watch the performance of the characters. So according to our client's suggestion and our user journey map, we want to test all the possibilities of balancing the invisible UI and the usability, which means with what result hint or text. And we created four different wireframes and prototypes for pre-testing. So after a couple of user testing, we found some challenges. Like if there's no any hint or text, people get confused easily, and they're going to spend a lot of time on finding items on the street. So we have to find a balance between the invisible UI and the clear guides. Our future plan is to do more user testing to identify an intuitive method of guides, uh, user, guides of users. So here's our current wireframe screen capture. This is our loading page. Here's our customized page. User can customize their unique character. User can drag down the page and to check the instructions, such as how to scan an item and what kind of item can be scanned. Click scan button starts to scan. Watch the performance of the character you just created. Next, I will talk about improving the application's performance. The technology backbone of our application is augmented reality, AR, and machine learning. The machine learning mechanism will take in the camera image as input, and once it recognizes a chosen object, and also detect a required floor, plane, or edge, the experience will start. And so there are a few aspects of the application that needs improvement. The first thing is the machine learning tool it's using right now is not supported by Unity anymore. And the other thing is it requires a very strong CPU to run smoothly, and it eats up a lot of energy. So regarding the machine learning tool, um, we are considering update the system in Unity. It, its original version is using TensorFlow Sharp and faster RCN Inception V2 machine learning model. 
And since TensorFlow Sharp is not supported by Unity anymore, we propose a new combination, which will use Unity Barracuda and YOLO v3 Tiny machine learning model. The reason why we choose Unity Barracuda is because it is a tool that provided by Unity officially. So for future maintenance and future development, we consider choosing this tool. It will provide long-term support from Unity. And also, um, YOLO v3 Tiny has better accuracy. So we successfully built a prototype using this combination with the pre-trained YOLO v3 Tiny machine learning model. And however, we found out that Unity Barracuda does not fully support every feature that this model is using. So we face an import error when we try to import the customized train machine learning model into Unity. According to the development team from Unity, they are, trying, they are working towards supporting these features. However, it's still a work in progress and they don't have an ETA for it yet. So to work around this problem, we will try to modify the model structure of this and um, if it doesn't work out at the end, we will um, accommodate using the pre-trained YOLO v3 tiny model and relink the uh, detectable objects with the experience that is originally existed. Or we will fall back to the old system. As of the other challenges we are facing, that it requires an advanced mobile device to run smoothly and it eats up a lot of energy. It is because we are running AR and machine learning simultaneously on a mobile device. We will try to tackle this problem by reduce the frequency that we run the detection or only trigger the detection process when it's really needed. So we'll be doing a live demo using this chair as a trigger. I have to be standing here because this cable only go this long, but um, yeah, so, sorry. When we open this app, yeah, we thought, first got this app from our client. It took us some time to run it through, but now we have replaced the machine learning system with our, with our YOLO v3, and we have put in our own R assets. So you can see that the AR now is detecting the surface of, on this chair. And when I move back and make, try to, on the machine learning is taking the picture up in the front, and it's, it's um, it's searching which of the 80 object it is. So now that it detects a chair, we can generate this donut hat that we built, and it's working towards this point. Yeah, and it's working perfectly on this ground. That's what the AR did, it detects the ground. So um, aside from this, we are use only using this chair because, oh, sorry. We are only using this chair because it's an indoor demo, but we also have it um, triggered on outside, outside things. Like in the middle, it is triggered by the, uh, the cat animation is triggered by the car. And then on the right, there's the indulgence animation triggered by the fire hydrant. So um, these animations were given by our clients, and these will be combined with our own assets and storylines in this app. Uh, so next, the artist will talk about character customization content. So our users can freely choose different body parts they want to create their own character. So instead of designing a whole character, we started with design different hats, upper bodies, and lower bodies with different skills and features while keeping the unity of the connecting portions. And here are our, some of our sketches. And so far, we're planning to implement nine body parts. So after the user create their own character, the character's head will greatly influence the character's behavior. Uh, so the character head design comes with its own personality. For example, the character with a donut head is more jolly and outgoing, so, it's more, uh, so the design is more round and lovely, comparing with this uh, robot head, which ha is more like, reserved and analytical, so the design is more sharp and rational. For different body parts, we also give them different personalities to enhance our creative storylines. Next is two examples of our character, so which are our best to create the characters that are unique and not cliche. So they will remind you of any popular IPs immediately, in which case we hope to attract a certain amount of users by just the appearance of the character design. 
So here's an example of motion capture being retargeted successfully to different components of these body makeups uh, using uh, a range of motion capture uh, that we collected shortly before quarters began. Uh, so the future of custom content in this app will look very differently once the app actually gets open to public domain. Uh, they plan to actually implement past the project semester for people to create their own content and add it to the app so that you can see their own characters within the uh, virtual neighborhood that you see. So our storylines and characters will act more as a proof of concept for this co uh, transition to community added content. So we started making some storyboard drafts of different triggering objects that we can currently recognize, like the car, the pole, the fire hydrant, uh, the stop signs, and of course, the bench. Uh, so we currently are moving forward with skits like the bench that you see up on the slide uh, that'll start to give a sense of the personality of these different heads that you can see and translate between the different customization options. So for the donut head in this one, uh, they decide to relax near the bench, a bird flies in and thinks the, bird's head is, the donut's head is food. Uh, the donut head gets aggravated and then chases the bird around, eventually getting exhausted. Contrastedly, the robot will then take the same stance at the beginning, being relaxed around the bench, the bird will wait expectantly as it lands on the per to perch on the head of the robot, where the robot will then surprise the bird by feeding it. So our future plans is to playtest the UI to create an intuitive guide for the user, as well as finding the balance between this intuitive guide and invisible UI. We also plan to finalize the machine learning uh, that we will use, as well as combine the previous version of the app with our current version. We also plan to play test these storyboards to determine the, tr the true trajectory of our character scenes, as well as finish UVing and cut the, uh, the texturing of these character models. Finally, we'll organize this project for future development. This is our metrics matrix that we're using to plan for the remainder of the semester. And thank you, do you have any questions? So the question is how we do how we deal with the lighting and the outside demo. Um, we're currently using a, a script that creates uh, that that turns the angle of the direction of light, then it casts a shadow onto the ground. But we haven't um, see we didn't have any um, sh shaders or something to make it looks better. Uh, past the project semester. Uh, the I, I understand. My question is, there's, you keep saying storyline. These are just little skits. Yeah. They don't continue one into the other. Is that correct? Uh, yes, currently so, they do. So in a user's experience, they're going to be part of the story making as well? Or are they just put in the art? Uh, so when people are able to create their own content, they will be uh, adding like skits and potentially storylines that do transition from one to another. Just okay. currently not yet. So the example you storyboarded was a bird picking at the donut head. If I picked a different head, would that have a different interaction? Like, do the he heads drive these different story circumstances? And how many animations are we planning on making? How many of these interactions? So the question is, uh, do the heads drive the animations? And how many animations do we plan on making? Uh, so currently, yes, the heads do drive the core of the animations, uh, as we believe that the head is what would be the primary, primary motivating factor for these skits. Uh, and we plan to make uh, around uh, three different scenes for each of these uh, head trajectories. So that currently is nine, but we also plan to see if we can use the body parts as like a way to tweak the animations so that way it feels like the body parts start to affect how the character walks versus how the character interacts with the space with that storyline. Are you having challenges there? 
Sorry, can you can you repeat your question again? Do all the models you have at the TensorFlow mm -hmm. library transition to your Unity 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 machine learning library? Mm -hmm. Is it one to one, or or are there any models that you have to build from scratch? Um, I am using the Yolo V3 Tiny structure to uh, use a customized data set to train the model. So but the transition seems to have some problem when I try to use the original one, uh, my custom trained one, put it into Unity. Okay, so you yeah. are custom training your own model. Yes. Time for one more. Hello everyone, we're Tim and Will. This is our team. Ricardo and Dave are our faculty advisors. So talking about our project, we're a student pitch project. We're making a 2D and 3D puzzle solving game in which the players play as Princess Jincheng and help Princess Wencheng go home. The art and narrative are inspired by historical events, faithful to the past, and will be approachable to a wider audience. So as you may wonder, who are these two characters? They are both princesses of the Tang Dynasty and they share the same fate of being married to Tubo emperors at a very young age. To clarify, Tubo was the Asian name of modern Tibet, and Wencheng was married 90 years earlier than Jincheng. Another thing they share in common is that they both made massive contribution to Tang and Tubo, but as a result, neither of them ever went back home again. That was inspired us of making this game for them to actually go home. So Jincheng wanted to go home, but she couldn't because of her duty, until one day, she imagined the journey of helping her ancestor, Princess Wencheng, go home in the mural, which also shows her own willing of returning. So next, we will talk about how we use game design to achieve this proposal. Thanks, Tingyi. All right, to start with the game design, I want to first talk about our design pillars. So first, we want to create a sense of serene, mysterious, religious, and dreamlike aesthetic. And also, the game's presentation style should convey the contrast between the innocence and the purity of Jincheng as a 14 year ago by the time, between the happy life that she was facing. And the character relationship we're trying to build is Jincheng as the 3D character, always trying to help the Wencheng in the mural as the 2D character to go home. So I'd like to show you a demo video about the gameplay that we have for now. And start with that, as we can see, that the 3D character is over here, and the 2D character is over here, demonstrated like a light bulb for now. And they're in our arch uh, Tibetan architecture. And every time when we hear the placeholder sound effect of the bean, that is when Jinchen make a call, and Wenchen will go to where Jinchen is facing at the, at the mural, till the end of the road. And we can do that again, like this. And the final destination for the Wenchen is at the very right of the map, but we can see both the roads for 2D and 3D are continuous. So how do we do that? We can from now magically shift the perspective and the roads are connected, even for 2D and 3D. And even 3D characters can move, ignoring the depth, like a side scroller. And to continue doing that, we gradually make Wenchen reach its final destination. Okay, 
So how does this gameplay re reflect back to our design pillars? First, in our game, only Jun Chen talks, makes sounds, comparing to Wen Chen is always a silent character. So we're trying to build that Wen Chen is actually an imagined figure in Jun Chen's mind, as Jun Chen is reflecting herself back to the ancestor with the same fate to express their both shared wish of going home. And then also, we want to create a sense that Jun Chen is actually a little girl playing with, her health, with herself, with her own imagination. She's talking to herself, and everything so, in that case, happened kind of magically and impossible. So in that way, she's relieving her unsatisfied wish. And the second is, in our game, only Jun Chen can make Wen Chen move. So the character relationship is a one-direction relationship. Only Jun Chen helps Wen Chen, in a case, actually helping herself. And we want to also convey a sense of distance between the Jin Chen and her wish. And from here, I'll pass it to Josh to talk about the level design. Thank you, Ray. So you might wonder how levels are created for this game. We start out with a 2D sketch of the level on the left. So you can see uh, basically like green lines uh, layered on top of the, this kind of red structure. Those are the broken you just saw that can only be traversed by shifting the camera. And when we have a solid 2D map, what we do is we uh, assemble the level uh, using the basic art pieces uh, created by our artists in the engine and try to test out the level and see if it works from there. And throughout the process of level creation, we pay close attention to level metrics. This has two very important advantages and purposes. First being, we, uh, level metrics create consistency throughout all the levels we create. And having consistency through all the levels will help the player navigate the space easily. And second, since early on the, the gameplay has, uh, has been going through a lot of iterations, uh, but that shouldn't be the bottleneck for art creation. So what we do is we create this solid uh, metrics so that the art can continue doing their work creating art assets while gameplay can, start, uh, can continue iterating. And this is basically the, what the pipeline looks like. We start out with a very rough block out in Maya and then we hand that piece to the artist and the artist sticking with the metrics create a more detailed level, uh, a more traversal space and then we put that level in the engine with effects, uh, fogs, lighting and we create something like the, uh, what you see on the right. So to talk more about tech and how we achieve this, let me hand it to Shushi. Thank you, Josh. As you can see, well, the designers have gone pretty, pretty crazy with their ideas. <laughs> um, why do we say that? Well, let's take a look at some of our challenges and ideas we have. First, we have the characters be able to move on arbitrary walls. That means walls that are angled at any angle or have cur curvatures on them. If you look at traditional platformers, usually they have a fixed axis that you can walk, walk on, basically left and right. Of course, we need to be able to do more than that. Another thing is how we can move across impossible spaces. Take a look at this example where you start at the left red circle and try to move to the right. As we mentioned before, you can walk on walls. So what do you do? You just follow the red line. Simple. But what if the path between is blocked? Now you can't walk along the walls anymore. In this case, we'll have to shift our perspective. That being said, we can switch to the side view, which shrinks down the wall in the middle, allowing us to skip a section of the walls. By doing that, our 2D character can ignore the wall and walk directly to the, our destination. How do we do that? The secret ingredient is splines. Splines that our designers, our designers can set up manually. They can define where each node leads, uh, leads you to under any circumstances, under any camera angles. And another similar question that we have is how our 3D character can walk like a 2D character when in the side view. In this example, you start from the left again and want to move to the right, but there's a boulder in between or a gap that you cannot walk on. Similarly, you can shift to the side view, which creates platforms on both the, the start and the destination, and allowing you to move across directly. How do we do that? Well, because everything is luckily in isometric space, we can simply teleport you secretly while the perspective changes. And we, by doing that, we teleport you to a place with our hidden collider set up. And you can walk on the colliders. When you're done, we ship you back to the place where you belong. Next up, Claire will be talking about some of the art details. 
All right, thank you, Zhuxin. So in order to create the character Jing Chen, the first thing we did was searching for her life stories and experience in order to find clues to create her character portrait. So back to the time when she was forced to marry with the Jubal Emperors, she was only a 40-year-old girl who was unfortunately not received a lot of love from her real parents because of the political situation. However, she was luckily uh, adopted by her uncle, Zhong Zhong, who was the Tang Emperor's back to the time. Zhong Zhong treated her as his real daughter because he sees a lot of things in common through her life story. However, getting used to the new life was still not easy for her because the people around her didn't always have the same attitude to her, just as Zhong Zhong does. Well, uh, she was grateful for the Zhong Zhong's kindness, but inside of her, she still had the desire for a sense of belonging, and she also wanted to be admitted by the family. So therefore, we extracted some keywords which can describe her personality well. She is an independent and a brave girl who is also lonely and innocent in the consideration of her age and the experience in her early childhood. And for the art style, we are aiming for more cartoony style instead of religious style to fit with uh, the gameplay and the environment, which is full of the dreamy uh, vibe and the imagination. And here is the character sketch and the design that we did. We eventually decided to go with the one on the really right, uh, right because we think it captures the feeling of an Asian princess back to the Tang Dynasty, and it also delivers well of the personality that we mentioned above. And here is some sculptures that we did in ZBrush already. Uh, we paid attention on her face because there is a possibility that we will have a zoom up camera view on her face to show her uh, facial expressions in order to deliver her emotional changes. And here is a full body sculpture with the hair on. And the next step was putting the model into Maya and modify the geometry. And we also used the marvelous designer to do the cloud simulation. And the tech challenge for the character department was how to rig the clothes because we are not going to rig it just as we rig the other body parts. Instead, we will be using the cloth simulation system in Unreal Engine 4. And uh, we will bring the models into the engine and uh, do the wave painting and uh, do a real-time simulation there. And this is something we need to test out as soon as possible. And now I will hand it over to Ariana to talk about the environment. Thank you, Claire. So for the environment art, I will be introducing from both the 3D and 2D parts. So based on our design pillars, uh, the overall mood and art style we're going for the environment can be summarized into those keywords. Serene, mysterious, religious aesthetic, and dreamlike. Inspired by um, the color palette of traditional Tibetan architecture, we are using vibrant and high saturation colors, such as carmine, sapphire blue, emerald green, and we neutralize the tone with softer colors such as light yellow and aqua green. And next, we're building the environment with diametric perspective with unified model pieces that have potential for 2D perspective visual illusions. And based on our research in Tibetan exterior and interior architectures, we actually found some really interesting elements and pieces that we can use in our environment. However, considering our scale and um, camera perspective we're going for, we actually have to simplify some of the elements and shapes so that the overall environment won't be too busy to look at, while still convey the style and mood of a Tibetan palace. And next, for 2D arts, so um, we're trying to preserve the art style of a traditional Tibetan mural um, while still have the production workflow um, unified and efficient for game. So here are some concept arts we have um, for the concept uh, for the 2D environment. And the 2D character will be built in, a, in the sim similar features and we will have her ready in, in our next playtest. And here are some reference images of the Tibetan mural. So as you can see, the actual Tibetan murals are rich in details and have specific color style. So how do we achieve this in our game? So we built a specific pipeline in Substance, Substance Designer to turn a flat color draft version of assets into a refined and stylized final look of the assets. And this can be applied to all the 2D art. 
We built specific filter pipelines, such as outline stroke, uh, ground and architectural textures, and golden glitters. And we export it into three different maps, the base color, roughness, and metalness. So here is a final look of the example assets. And next, I will hand it to Tianyi to talk about the sound design. Thank you, Ariana. So for sound design, we have integrated WISE with Unreal Engine to achieve easier audio controls and to reduce the work for programmers. This includes loop event trigger, animation synchronization, and many other useful functions. Uh, however, as currently, as a design or art is not fully decided yet, the full execution of sound effects are still within the land, but uh, stay tuned, it will be one of our short-term goals. And for the music, as you just heard in the uh, previous demo, we tried to use traditional Tibetan and Tang instruments to create the dreamlike fading we want. We chose some signature instruments from both Tubo and Tang to represent the time and the culture. However, there are certain instruments that are hard to find a plug-in or a clear sample for it, so we use similar sounding instruments to mimic the feel. Now let's talk about our next steps. So currently, we've finished our pre-production work and finished the first couple levels. To clarify, the length of the level is basically what you just see in the demo. And next, the next week, we'll start to work on the next two levels, which we already have a design draft, but waiting for greenboxing. Then, as we're going to have the spring break, we are expecting to finish level seven by week nine, and then by soft, we're finished the last two levels. After soft, we'll work to create an intro and outro to make the game complete. With that being said, this is the end of our presentation, and we are now open to questions. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, so, given the fact that you had, a, you had to give us a lot of backstory to what this is all about, I was unsure how the narrative of the story, or how the gameplay supports the narrative of the story. It seems more just gameplay, and I get lost in the story. I'm not sure. I just want to hear what you have to say. Uh, for now, actually, this is a problem. It's a challenge we're facing because we have a very limited scope in the intro and outro for the, for the narrative space and on the between it's the playable place. So we are sort of relying first on the intro and outro to give the background story of Jincheng. And also, we're trying to rely on the kind of self-talking those narratives while we are playing by Jincheng to tell the rest of the story. So the combine is kind of the current plan. And that's going to be what you really, that's going to be what it really works. So when you can get the narrative, follow narratives across it just to the game channel. Yep. Yes, please. The, the new isometric mechanic that you guys demonstrated, how often is that used? Is that a one-time puzzle that you solve? Is it reoccurring? How reoccurring? How does it, and additionally, how does it help to tell the story? So the question is, how often are we going to shift the perspective in the gameplay? Okay, so actually going to happen a lot because that will be the main mechanic for creating puzzles, how to connect different impossible roles like that. So they're going to happen a lot in the game, I guess. Okay. Yeah, and how does that tell the story is actually another challenge is because for now we're uh, controlling the 3D character as Jincheng, but the shifting perspective is now not controlled through the hand on behalf of Jincheng. But we're trying to figure out a way to see if we can shift the perspective on behalf of Jincheng, so in that way we can give more uh, immersion, saying that this kind of shifting perspective is Jincheng playing with their own imagination of there. Yes, please. Uh, what are the requirements for the presentation with you PowerPoint? I noticed you didn't. Can you tell me why? Uh, sorry, could you pardon the question again? Yeah, one of the requirements of this presentation was that you use PowerPoint and you use Google Slides. I'm just assuming that there was a good reason for that, and I'm curious what that was. Uh, anyone want to take that? <laughs> Yeah, it's just because we downloaded like a PowerPoint on the desktop and the video we put inside was still like a G Drive link. So like we tested out yesterday and it would just automatically send it back to the G Drive. Um, so why didn't you fix that? Um, yeah, uh, we, this is probably something we missed. So yeah, but we, we did have like a PowerPoint version downloaded on the desktop. Okay. Yes, please. So I see all these levels and I see all the challenges. You have 2D, 3D, and all these kinds of things. Uh, I didn't hear much about testing. I don't need to hear that now. But you're planning on delivering a whole game or just a slice? So the question is, are we uh, delivering the whole game or is it just a slice of the game, right? And you are testing? Yes, we're definitely going to test it. And we are, our current goal is to deliver the whole game from the intro to the outro as a deliverable whole thing. 
Yeah. So you are currently testing it outside of your routine? Uh, not yet. So to add on to that, uh, as we just have this playable demo, so we're thinking of, so the test of our game is that kind of divided into two parts. The first part is testing the gameplay part, which is what we have already have now, the gray boxing gameplay part. So that's what we are going to do starting from next week. And then another part is actually after we have the 2D art implemented, we'll test how the general atmosphere, the art fading. So that's kind of uh, maybe some couple of weeks later. Okay, good luck with that. Thank you. All right, that's time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, congrats to the teams who went today. Good job. And the faculty will see you on Have a nice lunch. Thank you. 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 Thank you.